A warm well, welcome to today's talk. It's Thursday the 1st of December. Now I want to give some global data on what's going on with COVID at the moment and try and help us to predict to some extent what's going to be happening over the next few months. And we're going to be using WHO data for that. Now I know the WHO is coming for a lot of criticism. Uh, but it certainly does produce uh, interesting data. And we believe this data is essentially uh, reliable. As far as it goes, there's constraints on the amount of data that can be collected, of course. Now, the WHO was very slow to declare a pandemic. We on this channel were talking about it for ages, and uh, they just didn't seem to uh, get round to it somehow. Maybe they didn't want to offend certain nations. 11th of March, they declared the pandemic. So um, given that they were very slow to declare the pandemic, I'm just wondering if they're going to be very slow to end it, because it's questionable whether we should be ending the pandemic now. Are we still in an emergency situation at the moment? Difficult to say, but um, I'll let you answer that one. But anyway, the, the point is there's no real sign that the WHO are talking about uh, officially ending the pandemic at the moment. But let's look at some of their data. A weekly epidemiological update. This was just published yesterday. And it's, it's the global week 21st to the 27th of November. Cases are essentially stable. Now, of course, everything we say about cases is somewhat irrelevant because basically people aren't bothering to test most areas. Um, but we'll talk about it really, really briefly. Um, 2.7 new, new uh, diagnoses made with testing. Uh, 637 million confirmed cases so far in the world. Um, what's the real number? Well, I can't imagine there's many people on this planet now have not been exposed to SARS coronavirus 2. So I think um, we are really into the endemic phase now because so many people have been exposed. It's, it's really hard to imagine in, in our Western countries, for example, anyone who hasn't been exposed now, unless they really are in a totally isolated situation. But uh, certainly everyone I can think of must have been exposed. So infections, exposures, cases, yeah, the, the cases are a very small percentage now, of course. Um, full regional number and graphics presented. So the, the WHO go through in great detail all of the cases in all these countries, but basically it's irrelevant because they're not testing. So we're, I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, now, uh, th th this is there. This is the only graphic I'm going to show here. Um, they do show it. In a great decline. Now, we see, basically we see, so this is what, that's January there. So this was the end of the Omicron spike. Since then, things have gone down dramatically in all of the global regions. So we can, pretty safe in saying there's been a great global decline in cases uh, and in deaths and in hospitalizations. That's uh, uh, all, all sorts of things are declining, thankfully. Not gone away, though. This is the point. Uh, geographical spread. Now, variants of concern. Now, um, to the cut to the bottom line here, we've had Omicron now for over a year, and um, it doesn't seem to be getting replaced with anything. OK, there's lots of evolution going on. There's, there's a little bit of recombination going on. But it, it's been a major force for stability. And as we saw, um, cases have gone down and we know hospitalizations and deaths have gone down dramatically since the advent of Omicron. It's interesting to speculate it's counterfactual but what situation would humanity be in if omicron hadn't come along if omicron hadn't been provided it's an interesting uh, debate but we're not going to have it but it's um omicron has been much better than the previous variants i think we're safe in saying so they've, they've sequenced about 95,000 uh, uh, sequences worldwide mostly in high income countries of course nearly all of these were omicron um, testing, very patchy, uh, places like Denmark and the UK still doing testing. Most African countries, apart from South Africa, doing very little uh, testing. But we'll have some other interesting data from Africa in a minute. So testing, pretty limited, but what we've got is um, <clears throat> BA5 and its descendants, Omicron BA5. And this BQ1 is a direct descendant of BA5, and that seems to be increasing now doesn't seem to be causing more severe disease, doesn't need seem to be causing more death. It just seems to be part of the natural background almost now. I don't really think there's too much significance from this, although it's certainly good to monitor it because there's always the unexpected. Uh, and BAQ1 has over 30 descendant lineages, so it's, that's evolution for you. It's uh, evolving into lots of descendant lineages. BA2, 10.1, up a bit, but I don't think we see any significance in that. 
BA4 down a bit uh, on, on, on assigned sequences, <clears throat> but presumed to be Omicron 10.1%. Uh, this uh, XBB, which is a recombination. So what happened here was um, someone was infected with both viruses at the same time. They got into the same cell and recombined into a slightly new virus. But again, although we were concerned about this, it must have happened so many times now. It hasn't caused a, a transmissible strain. So again, I think that's fairly good news. 3.8%, the only one that's registered by the WHO, the XBB, which is a recombination of two BA2s, uh, other, other BA2s, fours, relatively low. Now, weekly deaths. So to, just to summarise there, the, the bottom line is that um, it's looking like there's a lot of evolution going on in Omicron, but no major change into a more pathogenic strain, which is what we'd feared. It doesn't seem to be happening. Doesn't mean to say it won't happen, won't happen, but there's no sign of it at the moment. And Omicron being so transmissible, is hopefully outcompeting them. So, so there could have been more pathogenic strains that have evolved, but Omicron has simply outcompeted it. Interesting idea and um, really quite um, quite profound, really, that Omicron could have saved us some more pathogenic uh, variants. Now, uh, new weekly deaths down 5%, um, 8,400 on the week, 6.6 .6 million deaths altogether. Uh, frustratingly, they don't give the total number of deaths in uh, 2022 yet, but we know that they were near the uh, start of 2022, the end of 2021, because uh, of the spread of Omicron, even though it's somewhat less pathogenic, there was so much of it that uh, deaths were higher. So probably around about a million deaths globally in the world uh, so far in 2022. Most of the deaths, of course, the 6.6 .6 million confirmed deaths, most of these in uh, 2020 and 20. 21 of course in the major waves now in context there's 56 million deaths a year now what i've got on this graphic here the, these are the um the main global causes of death 18.56 million from cardiovascular disease then cancers and i just want to sort of mention these briefly to put covid into context to see where we are with it because unfortunately people do of course die. Um, so I've blown these up a little bit. These are the causes of death here. Cardiovascular, cancer. These are the most common cause of deaths globally. This is a global thing. Respiratory disease, digestive disease, lower respiratory infections, neonatal disorders, still a terrible amount of children uh, dying in early childhood uh, just after birth. And this is not including abortions. This is just uh, children that were live, born. Um, uh, neonatal disorders, dementia, then diabetes, uh, diarrheal disease. Diarrhea disease is still a very common problem, in, especially in poorer countries, and children get it, um, children get it, but they haven't got the reserve of fluid and electrolytes, and it's still a common cause of death, tragically, in the world's children, nearly always preventable, which makes it all the more, all the more tragic. Uh, liver disease, kidney disease, road injuries, 1.2 million. Wow. Tuberculosis, 1.18, HIV dropping down. So this year, um, COVID is probably around about this kind of level. So this puts it in context of global deaths. Um, good news on HIV, highly, anti, highly active antiretroviral therapy. Uh, actual treatment has reduced um, the uh, incidence, the death of, from HIV, and has massively reduced the transmission. So it just shows, goes to show that with viral diseases, e even though we have no vaccine for HIV, because of the health education strategies, and because of the therapeutic, the treatment lowering the amount of people with it, um, and therefore lowering the transmission, the viral load in many people is so low they don't transmit, although you've still got to be careful, of course. But that is really quite, um, quite promising that therapeutics can have been effective uh, in HIV. And if there was an ther effective therapeutic available for COVID, the same would happen with COVID because you would reduce the, amount of, um, reduce the amount of virus there. It's the same with antibiotics. So bubonic plague, the black death, still arises from time to time in the bubonic and pneumonic forms. But because we treat it with antibiotics, it doesn't get the chance to spread because we have an effective therapeutic and that's what's happened largely with the HIV pandemic. So there, there we are, a few, few more here. Um, suicides, terrible role of suicides, malaria, murders, 4, 415,000, Parkinson's disease, nutritional deficiencies, drowning, 
Common cause of death. I, I, I often ask my classes of students, does anyone here personally know someone who's drowned personally in their personal experience? And this is 18, 19, 20 year olds typically, or maybe people in their 20s. And, and it's surprising, um, probably about one in 50 of them, and I know it's not a scientific poll, but one, one in every couple of classes had known someone who drowned. Terribly common cause, uh, common cause of death, drowning, especially in, in, in poor countries, but not confined to that by any means. Meningitis, um, malnutrition, still terrible that that is there. Mental disorders, drug use disorders, hepatitis, poisoning, conflicts, uh, weather exposure, natural disasters. So um, that kind of puts COVID in context. It's, it's well down the rankings now and will continue to go down the rankings, I believe. So are we still in an emergency situation where the whole world sort of needs to be orientated around COVID? I think this data shows clearly not. Um, is it still an issue? Uh, I think previous data shows clearly it is. But is it an emergency still is, is, a, is a bit of a subjective, uh, is a bit subjective. Is it still an emergency? Um, I don't know. What, what do you think? Um, WHO seem to still think it is because it's still officially classified as a pandemic. Um, number of newly reported weekly deaths by regions. Now, this is interesting. Africa reported uh, nine deaths. So um, HIV, um, not HIV, just talking about HIV, COVID, um, essentially no COVID deaths in Africa. And this is consistent with the reports I'm getting from Kenya and Nairobi. It's not simply data lack. Um, COVID has basically um, finished with Africa, essentially, to all intents and purposes. Remarkably good news because they weren't equipped to handle it. Very, very good news indeed. And we've talked about reasons why this might be. European region, um, the, the deaths are down 35%. Americas, they're up slightly, 56 countries. Um, deaths, um, deaths up prime, largely because of deaths in the United States. And again, here we've got to, main, we've, I think we have to blame a lot of this on the lifestyle and the obesity in the United States. The, the, the tail of deaths in the United States is, is really quite long. Of course, the population is larger in the United States. These are just pure numbers. They are not adjusted for population size. Brazil, some deaths. Canada, also uh, some deaths, although down on the week. European region here, uh, 61 countries, deaths down by 35%. Uh, Italy down, France, uh, France down, 387 additional deaths, down 25%. Russian Federation, well, to be quite honest, who knows? Um, but that's what their uh, reports are claiming. Although uh, there is good data from Russia by people who've done this, looking at the regional reporting systems in Russia. And from that, we do know there's been an awful lot of deaths, more than the United States. And the highest excess deaths has been suffered by the ordinary people in the Russian Federation, which, of course, is, is, um, is, is, a, is a tragedy. Um, but there's probably a lot of immunity there now, so it probably is genuinely going down. Eastern Mediterranean down, 22 countries there, Saudi Arabia, few deaths, Iran. Uh, so small numbers of deaths in these countries. Lebanon, seven, no change. Uh, there's other regions as well. I'm not going to go into them all in great detail. So we see that cases down mostly apart from the Americas, which is um, largely accounted for by, I believe, the comorbidities in the United States. Uh, highest number of weekly new deaths, countries, the United States, 2,611, but of course, bear in mind the large population. Japan, uh, deaths increased in Japan. Um, very large elderly population in Japan, of course, um, did fairly well, we would say, in the first parts of the pandemic, but um, deaths are up there slightly now. Again, uh, Omicron is the variant in Japan, as Omicron is the variant in China, mostly BA5 in China, we believe. Uh, Brazil, uh, another one of the increases. Italy, uh, f again, this is in number of deaths, although the proportion was down. So Italy had 419 deaths, down 22%. China, well, we're getting different figures from China now, to be quite honest. Uh, they're saying 395 new deaths in the week. Now, this is WHO data. And WHO uh, don't like to upset China. So I think we can assume that this 395 new deaths in China is probably a minimum amount. If that is so, there's a lot more infection than is probably being admitted in China. So the endemic phase in China has probably started despite these appalling draconian lockdowns that are going on 
with riots and all sorts of things in China, um, it's not it's not a it's not a good socio uh, political situation because you can't stop this pandemic. Overall trends down. This is the final graphic for today, I think. So over, overall trends are down. So here we see the blue is the number of um, hospital admissions. We see those are down. Daily cases in grey, down, of course, largely because of lack of testing. Uh, number of new admissions to intensive care right down the bottom there. And daily deaths there in yellow, again, down. So the trend is definitely down. Northern Hemisphere winter, of course. What is going to happen in the Northern Hemisphere winter? Uh, not known yet. Slight increase in cases in the UK last week, but not really that significant. I think up about 14%, but on a relatively low amount. Most people in hospital in the UK are with COVID, not uh, for COVID. So I remain optimistic that this trend is going down as immunity increases. So that's a bit of a global update today. Isn't it amazing the way that Africa has basically, um, well, got away with the pandemic um, in Africa, the, the, the early fear and restrictions caused way, way more problems than the actual COVID itself did. Younger population, um, lots of uh, other immune stimulating uh, factors, um, different gut microbiomes, different parasites in the gut, different parasites that they're exposed to that can generate cross immunity and stimulate the immune system. Um, and other things going on in Africa that really people need to find out about. But really good news that the pandemic has essentially passed Africa by. And uh, do ge genuinely, do, do let me know um, if you think the emergency has passed. I tend to think it has, and it's probably time for the WHO to end the pandemic. But as we say, um, no sign of that yet. So slow to start, slow to stop flights out of China. Looks like they're being slow to stop, but that's subjective. Um, and that's, I think we'll, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for watching.